we're very confident that humans have put a bunch more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And we're very confident that that increase in, in greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is causing the planet to warm. The way we do things now is problematic and they need to change. People often talk about 100-year storms. The question is when it comes a lot or very frequently, it's no longer considered a 100-year storm. Climate change is either going to destroy everything that we hold dear or it's only going to destroy some of what we hold dear and we're going to take the cue from that destruction to change an awful lot of the ways that we live our lives. As I said in the first program, at a time when we read in the news that Earth's surface temperatures have reached a record high in 2016, and we have a new presidential administration that denies the impact that fossil fuels play in climate change, and in fact is intent on rolling back progress made at the national and international level to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it seems even more important that we talk about strategies to combat climate change at the local and regional level. My name is Doug Challenger. In this second conversation being filmed here at Amherst Media, we'll reflect further on the themes presented in the documentary film from Hurricane to Climate Change that I directed and helped produce with colleagues of mine at Franklin Pierce University in Ringe, New Hampshire where I'm a professor of sociology and a member of the Monadnock Institute of Nature, Place, and Culture, which is the academic institute that produced the film. While the film was focused on local communities uh, in southwestern New Hampshire, its themes seem applicable to the wider region. In fact, in the film are scenes of river flooding in Vermont as a result of Hurricane Irene in 2011 and scenes of uh, replacing culverts along roads where I live in Pelham, and images of farmers markets in Brattleboro and here in Amherst. To help us connect the film to Amherst and the surrounding community uh, or region, I have invited for this conversation two more guests to help us talk about ways in which towns and communities in this region are responding to climate change and its impacts. Our guests today are Christine Hatch, who is an Extension Assistant Professor of Hydrogeology at UMass at Amherst. Christine is the author of a recently published booklet entitled Supporting Communities to Become River Smart. It's the most complete analysis to date of the dynamics of stream flooding that has repeatedly devastated New England towns. Her report offers several suggestions about how towns and cities can strive to become resilient to future river floods. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much for having me, Doug. It's a pleasure to be part of your wonderful documentary. Thank you. Alex Kent, our other guest today, works as a self-employed Japanese-English translator, but describes his second job these days as being the leader of an effort to bring to Amherst a new worker and consumer-owned food co-op. And Alex is serving as the president of the board of directors. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me today. I'm glad to be here. You both may remember that the film opens with the statement, climate change is an invitation to a new life. What, what does that term mean to you, and how do you understand the, um, the challenges that climate change presents to us? Christine, maybe start with you. I love the way that the documentary opens on a positive note when it's so easy to get stuck in the doom and gloom of such a really large and global problem that seems intractable to a single individual. And for me, I think of Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything and how we as individual actors or individual small groups of consumers can really make a difference in this global problem. We can rewrite the rules of the game. We can demand with our dollars what kinds of change we want if, in fact, our administrations aren't playing ball with the global politic, if you will, of trying to address climate change on a, on a global governance scale. Was one of the things that we were trying to show in our, in our documentary film, the, the efforts that people are making at a great grassroots level to make a difference. Alex, how about you? Well, I joined the project to bring a full service worker and community owned grocery store to Amherst some years ago and was not thinking in terms of climate change. But over the years and through the outreach work we've done to the community and 
as the problem of climate change has come more and more to the forefront, it's clear to me that there is a connection between community action, people coming together to create a community and worker-owned business that will supply food to this community, that it has a direct relationship to how we address the problem of climate change. And we do that by reducing the distance that our food has to travel to get to us, by doing what we can to reduce the travel that we have to do to get to where our food is being sold. And, and in, another, in a larger sense, it's a way for the community to come together to take action, not just to improve their, their food supply and support local producers, but also to talk about ways they can act as a community to respond to the changes in our political climate. In, in our film, we, which was actually three years in the making, when we started out, we were talking to climatologists. Um, what they were saying that in terms of climate change is that it touches down in this region of, of the world, in southwestern New Hampshire and in New England more generally, by uh, increases in extreme precipitation events, and the you know the uh, the devastation that storm water and ice and snow from nor'easters in the winter could cause in towns like Peterborough and Keene that are located along rivers. But during the last year as we were finishing the film up, we were living in a, in a drought situation here in, in this region. And I'm just wondering, we didn't really touch upon it very much in the film, but Christine, as a, as a scientist, could you explain how it is that climate change can produce both flooding and drought at the same time? Sure, it's always one of those conundrums that's difficult to, to explain to the public. And you think about a weather event, and that's a single event in time, or weather over a particular year, or how much snowfall we get. And climate and climate change are really trends over decades, multiple decades. And so these really longer term phenomenon, and that's one thing that's um, important to keep in mind as we're watching these long term trends. But in terms of drought and, and heavier uh, rainfall events happening at the same time. These, these are both indicators of, uh, that we see out of climate change. And what happens is you get, for an increase in temperature, an air mass can hold more water. So the, the, the warmer the air is, the more water it can hold. So even if you had exactly the same number of rainfall events at exactly the same intensity as they might otherwise have been, when you add that increase in temperature, every single one of those events becomes more intense, even if it's the same number. So suddenly it registers on our radar as, an, as a more extreme event. And with that, you get more rain per minute or more rain per hour. And so those can be um, much more dramatic in terms of river flooding because the water can rise much more quickly and, and cause more damage, they have more power. Um, and then the drought side of things, again, with a rise in temperature, instead of seeing New England has the benefit of having fairly even precipitation across the entire year. So you get some rain every single month throughout the year, and that's sort of even, and that's really fantastic for agriculture here. But with climate change, if you increase that precipitation in the summer months, where it's warm anyways, you reduce some of that surface moisture. The moisture is taken up into the air. It doesn't fall out as precipitation, and so you lose that. So you get both a drought and these in increasingly intense events with these increases in temperature. I'm just wondering, uh, as someone who's, who studies rivers and streams a lot, and, and clearly they have been critical to life in, in New England towns and communities, and I'm just wondering what you and other scientists are learning about rivers and streams in light of, especially in light of the environmental changes brought about by climate change. And, and how, how do you think we should be preparing to meet the challenges these changes present to us? Um, one of the great ironies of coming out with our, our River Smart Communities report with my colleague Eve Vogel was that as soon as we were finishing it up and getting ready to talk to people about it, we of course were in the middle of this drought and people were tired of talking about Irene and, and all of the damage that, that the river has had caused during Irene. But it was still close enough to think about, um, well, we don't want to be in that same situation again. We don't want to be vulnerable to these really extreme river flows. And so we really started to try to think about educating people on how rivers work. Rivers move. They don't stay in place. They don't stay in one place. They can migrate back and forth. And if, if we actually step back just a little bit and give that river more room 
to do what it's going to do anyway, particularly with stronger flows that we expect to come with climate change, that we can save ourselves a lot of money and heartache and, and not disrupt our transportation systems and not disrupt our food delivery systems and not disrupt our infrastructure and, and spend an awful lot of money doing that and re replacing roads and crossings and so forth. Um, but instead, be a little bit more forward thinking about it and, and be willing to step back and give that river a little bit more room. And at the same time, by allowing that river to be connected to its floodplain, which is probably where the roads are anyhow, um, it, a little bit more, give it a little bit more space, it actually slows down those extreme flows and makes them less damaging and just has that flood wave have a slower, longer time to seep into the ground and move its way down the hill slope. And that's beneficial for the, all of the ecological systems that are connected to it as well, both the ones that exist in that floodplain environment as well as the river system. It needs to be connected to that floodplain and have an exchange laterally with the sediment and the organisms that live there in order to be a healthy river overall. Are there uh, changes in infrastructure that that, that kind of approach would uh, require or, uh, I mean, making that more... The, the approach, what, what does that re require us to do? One of the recommendations that we put forth in the report is to support road stream, uh, to um, replace road stream crossings and culverts that are undersized. And so what happens, again, if you have these larger flows, when you get to an undersized structure, it's very easy to overtop it and, and destroy it completely. But if you have a large enough open structure, often that's open at the bottom as well, you can actually pass a lot of flow, you can pass a lot of storm debris, you can pass big logs, you can pass all sorts of things underneath that without damaging the structure. And so in the long term, it's a much better investment to have uh, a properly sized structure and there's um, many groups that are working on stream continuity to have continuity of habitat, and that being the motivation. But it's really a win-win on both sides for the ecology and for human infrastructure and our resilience to these kinds of storms. I was wondering, when you were watching the film, and the film begins with the hurricane of 1938, and the, and the response to that was to build these huge, massive flood control dams all around New England, not just up in that region, but... Um, is the approach you're talking about uh, a, a much different kind of thing, I think? It's a different kind of thing. It's a, it's a very different scale. It's, yeah. um, it's a smaller bridge kind of replacement. Flood control uh, is a, a very big federally funded program um, that, that's very top down. And we won't see, I don't think there's a river in the United States that will see the kind of big regional scale flooding except for maybe the Mississippi today because of these kinds of flood control dams unless one of them bursts in which case we will be woefully unprepared for it because we wouldn't, wouldn't have you know we, we've now become very complacent that those are there protecting us and holding back the largest of the flows like 1938 1936 and 1938 are the largest events on record and we probably won't see an event that big thankfully yeah. <laughs> um, just to switch gears a little bit, uh, another interesting thing that came up in our film was when we were um, interviewing the town of Keene's uh, city, the city planner, Rhett Lamb. He was telling us about how when they were creating their climate adaptation plan back in 2007, they had a lot of conversation about food and where food comes from. And he said that that isn't usually a topic that city planners get involved with a lot. But actually, out of those discussions came uh, a, an idea, a, an effort to f help fund a feasibility study for a new fo food co-op in Keene that actually has subsequently been organized by community members and was opened in 2013 called the Monadnock Food Co-op. And I was thinking of you, Alex, like, as someone actively involved in founding a, a local food co-op right now here in Amherst, I was wondering how the film, that part of the film resonated with you and what, what things it brought up to you in terms of how you see a similar, similar co-op efforts around this region contributing to addressing climate change. Well, it certainly does resonate with me because it's, it's really exciting when uh, city planners have foresight enough not only to look at 
infrastructure like roads, bridges, and culverts, but also to look at something as basic as the food supply. And it would be my hope that we in Amherst and in this region have similar foresight and would support a project that's intended to localize our food supply and to support our local, local producers more effectively. So I think that uh, awareness of climate change provides us with an opportunity to come together over not just hot, you know, water, direct water and road infrastructure projects, but also our food infrastructure and the infrastructure of our community in general. So it, it is no coincidence that Monadnock Food Co-op got started about the time that the people in Keene became aware of the connection between climate change and the food supply and that the market project went forward on that understanding. Just to go a little bit further on, on that connection between growing food and selling it more locally and the long-term impacts it has on, on climate change uh, and reducing our carbon footprint and so forth. I'm just wondering, you know, in the film there was a lot of talk about localism and uh, I remember Cameron Wake, who is a climatologist at UNH, was saying that there's a, a low-level conversation going on in the region, in fact, nationally, about uh, how we could start investing more in our local community, you know, kind of shifting our investments away from Wall Street and more to Main Street. And um, it strikes me that, that a food co-op is, is a great vehicle for investing locally. I mean, what are, what are some of the other benefits that come uh, from establishing a food co-op in a town and uh, in addition to sort of reducing our, our global or our carbon footprint? Well, a food co-op and our food co-op will carry local, locally produced source products to the extent possible. But we have to remember that we're used to eating bananas and citrus fruits and we don't grow them here in the Pioneer Valley. They have to come from far away. So that's a, a realization I think that we have to come to terms with. I think that a, a really important benefit of a community supported venture like a food co-op is that it brings the community together in a common space. A market can and should be a place where people come together. And one of the statistics that you cited in your film that really resonated with me was the comparison between the numbers of encounters that people have in supermarkets versus the encounters they have at, say, a farmer's market. And the statistic you presented was that there are 10 times more people-to-people -people encounters at a farmer's market than there are at a supermarket. When we go shopping at the supermarket, I think we've all had the experience of kind of going into the zone. We go to aisle to aisle and fill the basket, and then we're out. We might say, hello, how's your day, to the cashier, and we're out. But a farmer's market is a place where you can spend as much time as you like talking to people. We've seen that here at the farmer's markets here in Amherst, and you see that also in food co-ops. Not only in the process of shopping is it a chance for people to come together, but co-ops usually, and ours will certainly, contain a community space, which is a place where people can gather to share information about food, about cooking, but more than that, community action, possibly political organizing. How do we respond to the challenges of climate change? How do we respond to um, a, a federal government that seems to have turned a blind eye to this serious problem. Those are the things that a food co-op can do. Helps build, build community. Yeah. And, and, and in, our, in our film, Bill, Bill McKibben, you know, the environmentalist, uh, activist, and writer, he says that he's getting asked all the time, you know, where can I go to get out of the way of climate change? And his answer is always that you want to be in the places that have the strongest possible communities, because that's what we're going to need when things get tougher. A lot tougher, he says. And uh, I mean, I'm wondering, in the, in the few minutes that we have, just briefly, if you could talk a little bit about what Bill McKibben says there and like, you know, what does it mean to you when he says that? How, that, we, that we should see, that we should see um, the challenges that climate change uh, presents to us in, in this way, that um, community, strong communities is what we need to be focusing on. I guess I think of a couple of things um, based on our river research when, when Bill McKibben says that he wants to get to a place with strong community. And one of those things is that, you, you know, we think about these really big events like an Irene 
a Hurricane Irene event, and it's you know it has a, a frequency of or a return interval that's very very long, and so we can easily forget it. But what we shouldn't forget is that there's a storm of that magnitude somewhere in New England every single year, and so while mm -hmm. this particular one that hit in this particular place might have been uh, a one-off for that community for a generation. It certainly isn't for the region. That's the storm for, the, for New England this year, and next year there'll be another one. And so being able to have communities that um, can really come together when one of these events occurs, and if they get very isolated, as, as happened during Hurricane Irene, particularly in Vermont, where the roads were cut in so many places for so long, the more of the resources and food supply and and just community goodwill to help each other out are local and, and connected within a small geographic area. If, if a, a road or two is out for a week, well, you've got your neighbors in your network that's close enough by that you can help each other out and, and lend a hand. And the stronger that micro community is, the more resilient that community will be to these kinds of events and other things that climate change may throw at us. It comes down to a choice people can make and a recognition. How vulnerable are we? That's difficult to assess, but the climate events, the weather events that we have seen in recent years suggest that we are vulnerable. We can choose to accept that and depend on systems that are controlled from far away, or we can opt to become, to move in the path toward greater resilience. And I think that uh, cooperative ventures, whether they're food or other services that are vital to the community, are really important ways to build that kind of resilience. Neighbors coming together with neighbors, as Christine says, to help each other in times of trouble, but also to take steps to avert those kinds of troubles. That kind of awareness is fundamentally political. It's not political in the sense that most people think of it, but it's coming together as a polity, as a group of people living together in a local place, which is where we all live. <laughs> we all live locally. We have, to, we have to look at our locality and see what we can do together to make it a, a better and safer place to live. And, and, and I think that coming together for a common cause like, like a, a grocery store, a co-op grocery store, is a good example of that. It's been a pleasure talking to both of you this morning. And you know, thank you for sharing your experience and expertise and participating in this discussion of the film uh, From Hurricane to Climate Change. And, commenting on how citizens and scientists in Western Massachusetts are addressing some of the important themes that it brings up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.